Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're going to be looking at prompt engineering, a technique for getting the most out of large language models. The brains behind AI assistants and chatbots. Exactly. I got totally fascinated by this um, when I was looking at this new AI writing app. It claimed it could write anything, poems, code, anything. Really? But then I started wondering, how do these things even work? That's the million dollar question, right? How do they work? Yeah. And uh, more importantly, how can we get them to work better? Okay, so that's where this prompt engineering comes in. Our source for this deep dive is an excerpt from the OpenAI guide on prompt engineering. Okay. And it's like a masterclass in like communicating with AI. Interesting. But first, let's just make sure we're all on the same page. What exactly are these large language models? Well, think of them as uh, super sophisticated algorithms that are trained on a massive amount of text data. I mean, a truly massive amount. They can generate human quality writing, translate languages, write different kinds of creative content, and even answer your questions in a really informative way. It's almost like having a super powered writing assistant, right? Right. But here's the thing that really surprised me. These models aren't mind readers. Right. The OpenAI guide calls this the mind reading myth. Yeah. You know, they don't instinctively know what you want. Right. One of the most important things to understand about prompt engineering is that you need to give these models clear, specific instructions to get what you're looking for. So it's more like giving someone directions. Exactly. And just expecting them to know where to go. That's a great analogy. Think about giving a student a test. Okay. If the instructions are vague, you're going to get vague answers or even completely wrong ones, right? Right, right. It's the same with AI. That makes a lot of sense. So how do we avoid that confusion and make sure we're getting the best possible results from these models? Well, the OpenAI guide lays out like six key strategies, oh. and the most fundamental one is writing clear instructions. Okay, that sounds pretty straightforward, but what does that look like in practice? It all comes down to specificity. Instead of asking a broad question like, how do I add numbers in Excel? Right. You want to give the model a really concrete scenario. Mm. So you could say, for example, I want to add a row of dollar amounts in Excel and have the total appear in a column labeled total. Okay. The more context you give it, the better the model understands what you're trying to achieve. So we're not just giving commands. We're kind of painting a picture with words. Yes. So that it can see what we want. Exactly. There are also some other neat tactics you can use. You can actually ask the model to adopt a specific persona. Oh, wow. Like a playful friend or a formal business professional, and that'll change the tone and style of the output. Hmm, that's interesting. But how do you, like, choose the right persona? There are so many possibilities. That's a great question, and something we'll definitely look at later on. Okay. You can also use things like delimiters. Like what? Like triple quotes or XML tags to clearly separate different parts of your request. So it's almost like we're giving it um, formatting instructions, like we're coding. You got it. It helps the model understand the structure of your request, which ultimately leads to much better results. Another powerful strategy is providing reference text. Okay, I like where you're going with this. You give the model relevant background information so it can give you more accurate and reliable answers. Okay. Especially when you're dealing with you know specialized topics. So we're essentially saying, Here's what you need to know to succeed. You nailed it. Huh. You can even tell the model to only use information from that reference text when answering. Really? Or to answer by giving you citations from the text. It's really helpful for research. Wow, that's really impressive. So we've covered writing clear instructions and providing reference text. What's next on our prompt engineering checklist? Well, the next strategy is to break down complex tasks into simpler subtasks. This helps the model process information in a way that prevents errors. So it's kind of like when we're coding, right? Like breaking yeah. down a big project into smaller modules. Exactly. Let's say you have a, a complicated customer service query. Okay. Instead of just throwing the whole thing at the model at once, you could break it down into stages. First, you could have the model classify what type of query it is and then use that classification to trigger specific instructions for handling that kind of request. Wow, that's a, that's a much more organized approach. It's like a step-by-step -step guide for the model. Right. And along those lines, another key strategy is giving the model time to think. Just oh. like we need a moment to think through a problem, models can benefit from having a little extra time to process information and come up with the best response. So it's not just about speed, it's about giving it the mental space it needs to do its thing. Absolutely. One tactic they mention in the guide is having the model solve a problem itself before checking a student's answer. Huh. So it forces it to do some deeper thinking 
and can help it catch errors that it might have missed otherwise. Oh, that's really clever. It's like having it double check its work. Right. And then there's this other strategy that can really boost the model's abilities using external tools. Ooh, now this sounds interesting. What kind of tools are we talking about? Well, you can link the model to a search engine, for example, to help it find relevant information from a huge database. So it's like giving it a research assistant. Exactly. To go and fetch certain data. You can even connect the model to a code executor. So it can actually run calculations or execute pieces of code. Wow. So we're not just talking about text anymore. We're talking about like giving it much broader capabilities. Precisely. And the final strategy, which is really crucial for refining your prompts, is testing changes systematically. So it's an iterative process. We don't just make a prompt and call it a day. We're like constantly experimenting. Exactly. The key is to create a test suite where you can compare different versions of your prompt and see how effective they are. Okay, so it's like conducting experiments to see which ones work best. It sounds like you're really starting to get it. Yeah, I think so. There's definitely a lot to unpack here. Now that we've looked at the overall strategies, there are a few specific tactics I'd love to explore in more detail. Oh, I'm all for that. Which ones are you most excited about? Well, that idea of asking the model to adopt a persona is particularly fascinating. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. There's so many possibilities there. Imagine being able to tell the model to respond like a close friend or a business professional or even, you know, a famous historical figure. Yeah, that would be amazing. Maybe we could explore that a little bit further. Absolutely. But first, I think it's a good time to take a little break and let all of this sink in. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground so far. You're right. That was a lot. We'll be back in a bit to uh, delve deeper into those specific tactics. Stay tuned. Okay, so we're back and ready to get tactical with those really cool prompt engineering techniques. You got it. We were talking about asking a model to take on a specific persona. Oh, yeah. Um, it's such a versatile technique. I am really curious to hear more about this. I can see how it would be super helpful, but also maybe a little tricky to get right. It can be, yeah. Yeah. But the rewards are huge. Imagine you're writing like a marketing email, for example. Okay. You could tell the model to write it as if it was uh, like an enthusiastic brand ambassador. Oh, that's cool. So instead of getting something dry and corporate sounding, we'd get something that's much more engaging and human. Exactly. Mm. Or let's say you need to write a formal complaint letter. Okay. You can instruct the model to write like someone who is stern but professional. I see. I see. That would really help to set the right tone. But wouldn't it be hard to make sure the AI sticks with that persona throughout the entire piece of writing? It's definitely something to be mindful of, but with careful prompting and feedback, you can really guide the model to stay consistent. Okay. And the beauty of this tactic is that it goes beyond just writing. Oh, okay. Think about uh, like chatbots, for example. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You could create a chatbot that feels like you're talking to, you know, a wise mentor or even like a playful friend. Yeah, that's really neat. It opens up a lot of possibilities. Totally. Now, another technique that I find really clever is using delimiters. Oh, right. We, we mentioned that earlier. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about this. It's about like using specific markers to separate different parts of the instructions. Right? Precisely. Yeah. Delimiters, things like triple quotes or XML tags, they act as uh, signposts for the model. Mm -hmm. They help it distinguish between different parts of your request. So it's like giving it a roadmap. Yes. So it doesn't get lost. Let's say you want the model to summarize a piece of text and then translate it into another language. Okay, yeah. I can already see how that could get confusing. You could use, like, triple quotes to enclose the text you want summarized and then a separate delimiter, like maybe double dashes, yeah. to indicate the target language for translation. I see. So the model knows exactly which part to summarize and which part to translate. Exactly. Delimiters just provide that crucial structure and clarity especially when you're working with really complex prompts that involve multiple steps. It's like we're making the model's job easier, and that gives us better results. Couldn't said it better myself. Yeah. Now let's switch gears a bit and talk about um, a slightly more advanced technique. Okay. But an incredibly powerful one for knowledge retrieval, embeddings-based search. Oh, this is the one I've been waiting for. I've got to admit, though, this whole concept of embeddings, yeah. I don't really get it. That's totally understandable. It's a bit of a head trip at first, you know? Yeah. The simplest way to think about embeddings is that they're a way of representing text as um, as numbers. As numbers or, or vectors. So we're turning words into numbers? Yeah. How does that even work? 
It's pretty amazing. Yeah. These vectors capture the meaning and relationships between words. Hmm. What's cool is that words or phrases that have similar meanings end up having similar embeddings, meaning their vectors are close together in a kind of multidimensional space. Okay, so it's like like a map of language where words that are related are grouped together. Exactly. Now, imagine you have this massive database okay. that's full of information, like a movie database. I'm picturing all the movies, the actors, directors, all the reviews. Yeah, you can create an embedding for every single piece of information in that database. Wow. And you have this huge network of vectors, all connected based on their meaning. It's like a web of all the movie knowledge we have. Yes. Now, let's say you want to find all the movies directed by a certain director. Okay. You can turn your query into an embedding as well and use a special search algorithm to find the most similar vectors in your database. So the algorithm would be like pinpointing those data points that are most similar to the director query. Exactly. It's a really elegant way to search for information based on meaning yeah. rather than just matching keywords. Wow, that's so cool. It's like a super search engine that understands what you're looking for, not just the words you're using. You got it. And the best part is that you can use embeddings to search through any kind of data. Really? Research papers, legal documents, anything. And when you combine this with a large language model, you're essentially giving the model access to this incredible amount of knowledge. That's like giving it a super brain boost. So by using these different techniques, we can really get these models to do some amazing things. Exactly. And, you know, what we've covered today is just a glimpse into the world of prompt engineering. There's so much more to explore. Yeah, it really does feel like a whole new frontier. It is. But um, maybe we should take a quick step back. Yeah, that's a good idea. And just recap everything we've learned so far. Definitely. We'll be right back with some final thoughts and a challenge for you to think about. Welcome back to the deep dive. My mind is still buzzing after learning about all those prompt engineering techniques. It is pretty mind-blowing, isn't it? So much potential there. So where do we even go from here? What's the, uh, what's the main thing our listeners should take away? I think the biggest thing is that prompt engineering is totally changing the game when it comes to AI. Okay. We're not just using AI tools anymore. Right. We're shaping them. We're guiding them, you know? It feels like we have, like, a lot more power now. Exactly. It's like we're collaborating with AI instead of just being passive users. I like that, collaborating with AI. And we're just getting started, right? Yeah, we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more to come. As those large language models keep getting better, right. the techniques for interacting with them will have to evolve, too. It's like we're seeing a whole new field being born right in front of us. Yeah, it really is. And the possibilities are endless. And that's why I think it's so important for everyone to, you know, get involved and start experimenting with these techniques. Yeah. See what they can do, push the boundary. Be creative, see what happens. I love that. Prompt engineering is like this awesome blend of art and science. Right. And it's through that, uh, through experimentation, that will really unlock its potential. Now, before we wrap up, I have a little challenge for our listeners. Okay, let's hear it. You know how we talked about asking the model to adopt different personas? Uh-huh. What if you could teach it to write in your style? Oh, wow. That's interesting. Your unique style. Like creating a personal AI writing assistant that captures my voice. Yeah. What kind of examples would you give it? Hmm. What parts of your style would you want it to pick up? That's a tough one. Yeah. I'd have to really think about what makes my writing mine. Yeah, it's something I'm going to be thinking about, too. Yeah. Maybe we can explore it in another deep dive sometime. I'd be up for that. But for now, I think this is the end of the road for our prompt engineering journey. Oh, it's been so fun exploring all this with you. Likewise. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into prompt engineering. Keep learning, keep exploring, and keep pushing those boundaries. This is The Deep Dive, signing off. <laughs>